Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't quite ready for that. Russ came and dug me out of my packing duties. <laughs> okay, so our final class then, a little bit shorter, uh, 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 as we kind of think about um, drawing our thoughts towards bread and wine. And that's going to work very easily and very naturally, because this is where we're really going to see what is the point of this actual book. We've got a little bit more detail left. Uh, to look at, and then we're going to look at the big picture. Why is this book in scripture? What role is it playing? Russ had asked me uh, that explicit question uh, just yesterday, in fact. <clears throat> Let's start with, uh, actually maybe we will take a reading, because we haven't had a chance to read them for the loud. And let's think about uh, the, uh, the, last, the very last part of the book itself. Chapter 8, let's start at verse 8 and read to the end of the book. See, can you read that for me? <clears throat> and then I be. We have a little sister, and her breasts are not yet grown. What shall we do for our sister on the day that she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we will build towers of silver on her. If she is a door, we will enclose her with panels of cedar. I am a wall she says, and my breasts are like towers. Thus I have become in his eyes, like one bringing contentment. Solomon has a vineyard in Baal, Haman. He let off his vineyard with the tenants. Each was to bring for its fruit a thousand shekels of silver. But my own vineyard is mine to give. The thousand shekels are for you, Solomon, and two hundred are for those who tend its fruit. He, you who dwell in the gardens with friends and attendants, let me hear your voice. She, come away, my beloved, and be like a gazelle, or like a young stag on the spice-laden mountains. So I think finally that rather what used to be bizarre text to me finally has some resolution. First of all, we have this idea, we have a little sister, what should we do for her? It's not immediately clear who's speaking. And immediately after this speech, the next comment is hers, definitely. I am a wall and my breasts are like towers. So, whose little sister is it, would you suppose? Don't know, it's fair enough. The bride. The bride. The most natural reading is to say it's her little sister. You know, there's the older woman or the older woman marriage with bride, and it seems she has a little sister. Turns out, I was surprised to discover, that cannot be true. It's the only thing we can rule out. The bride doesn't have a younger sister. Look, she actually, he says of her, my dove, my perfect one is unique, the only daughter of her mother. Now we know she's got brothers, because it says so in chapter one, so I used to think it was her little sister. Um, that's exactly where I was coming from. But clearly there's a verse that says, no, it's not. And it was only later to realize what's, what's going on here that actually fits with our theme. This is the brothers who are speaking, and they're talking about her. It's a reprise from days. So either the brothers are speaking, or to say the same thing, she's quoting them. And this makes sense with the theme, because she's saying, look how you used to fuss over me. You brothers, or we have a little sister. We, whatever happens, we're going to have to take care of her. Because she's obviously too useless to take care of herself. If she becomes a wall, whatever that means, we'll do this. If she becomes a door, whatever that means, we'll do that. What shall we do for our sister? And this is now the day she's spoken for. This is now the day she's married. She has married and subdued and subjugated the most powerful man in the known world. And so she's repeating their words back to them. I don't think you needed to fuss over me, did you? Right? You think you needed all this? Well, look. I am a wall of being a wall or a door. I am a wall, and my breasts are like towers. So don't you worry about fussing over me anymore. I am effectively, I am probably a greater success than any or all of you brothers put together. Okay? The little sister is the bride. It's the brother's view that's being quoted here. And now that's relevant, because the whole point is what has become of her, that she's subdued a king. And that's why she can go back to her brothers and say, what do you need to fuss over me for? I am a tremendous success in my own right. Let's have a look at that little, uh, so there is no little sister. It is her the whole time. It's just a reprise of the past. If she is a wall, such and such, if she is a door, we will enclose her with panels of cedar. 
What do you think is being meant by a wall or a door? How do you know those used in scripture or reality? Jesus is the door. Jesus is the door. Jesus is the door to the sheepfold. It's, a, it's whether or not it's a gateway, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And to some extent, it's whether or not it's, it withstands the attacker or whether it yields. It's interesting, therefore, that Jesus is one who yields in that he yields entry <coughs> into the household of God. A wall keeps things out, a door lets things in. So within the, but within the context of the Old Testament and, war, and wars, therefore, walls were good because they withstood the enemy whereas doors yielded. So I think what she's saying is, look, I met this man, and he had this particular culture and religion and whatnot, and I had this particular culture and religion and whatnot, and when the two meet, or whenever two cultures meet, not both can survive. One has to yield to the other. Somebody has to be a wall, and somebody has to be a door. And she says, I am a wall, right? I stood strong. I'm still Lebanese. I still worship my Lebanese God. And this man, by implication, Solomon, he was the door. He was the yielded, yielding one. And, he, and she says, my breasts are like towers. I don't think she's necessarily describing her physiology and saying her breasts are large. I think what she's saying is, this was the focal point of my, of my victory, of my strength. It was my sexual form. This is what won the battle. This is what won the door for the day. So I withstood, he yielded, and it was my sexuality that won the day. And the bride has prevailed over the king of Jerusalem. He has forsaken her, his God, and he follows her, and indeed her God, <coughs> now. Just a, a little justification on this idea, I am a wall, my breasts are like towers. <clears throat> the idea that a tower is a representation of power. I think we see that in the Bible and in, um, in real life. Do you have a, a company that lives in a skyscraper? I can tell you right now where the directors are going to be. I can tell you right now which floor they're going to be on. And I'm going to be right every single time. There is something curious about the human psyche that says if you're more important, you need to be higher up physically. Isn't that strange? I bet you won't find an example of a five-story building where the bosses are on any floor other than number five. I challenge you to find it. Where's the original version of this? Eunice, you're right on song saying Genesis now. <laughs> Good job. Where, you, where, where is the story that really starts to show the human psyche about thinking that a tower is power? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Come, let us build a tower. And the reason to build a tower is so that we may make a name for ourselves. It's almost like grasping equality with God. We're back in the Garden of Eden all over again. And in actual fact, do we merely look back thousands of years and say, oh, those silly people thousands of years ago, it remains, well we've seen it, and we've also seen this idea, therefore that allows us to translate this, what used to be the power of David in Solomon's mind became the power of Lebanon, right? that was his ruling power of transition, and again it's not just history, even today, to this very day, we all want to keep track of, well who's got the biggest tower, and it used to be the United States with the Empire State, and then it was, uh, whatever that is, I better say that right here. All right, Sears Tower. Then there was the. This is this is in Malaysia. I've seen that one and this one. And the current one is is dwarfs them all. This is in Dubai, uh, Kingdom Tower, ironically. Although pretty sure that soon that will be dwarfed as well because China are already in process of building one that will be even taller. And but without uh, you know on a serious note, you know, this is this is again part of the human psyche. If you can't, you can't destroy 300 million Americans. So what at least can you do to show a symbol of power? Well, we'll knock their towers down. And, and so what, what's the American response domestically? Build another one. Build a bigger one. Yeah. And that's what they're in the process of doing. Those who don't understand history are condemned to repeat it. That's the human psyche. You knock your towers down, we're going to build an even bigger one. And one day someone will knock that down, we'll build an even bigger one. So it's just caught in this. Uh, so when she makes this comment, that's what I understand to be saying. I have prevailed. My sexuality is my power. My breasts are like towers. I think that's a very natural translation, given what we know from both scripture and, uh, and all other uh, human observations. So then, here are the final verses which she's read for us. We have this fussing of the brothers. We have a little sister. If she's a wall, we will build towers. And she says, no, 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 I am a wall, and my breasts are the 
the towers. You don't need to build any power for me. I don't need to fall back to my brothers, even in a time where it was a very male-dominated society. She says, no, I've made something of myself, thank you very much. Then we came on to this verse we looked at yesterday. Solomon had a vineyard in Baal Hamon. Sol Solomon took women to, the, to be a god of excess. Uh, the thousand are for you, Solomon. He ends up taking a thousand vineyards. This now all fits in context. Because he's so susceptible to beautiful women, it makes sense that this became his false guard and that he ended up with an excessive uh, amount of them. This is now, you know, these, these statements are no longer just odd things being said, but they, they flow very naturally. Uh, the victory via her sexuality, followed by uh, Solomon's absolute falling to the god of sensuality. And his very next comment now makes sense. He says, you who dwell in gardens, let me hear your voice. So what does that now translate to being said? He's not hearing God. He doesn't want to hear God. He wants to hear from those who dwell in gardens. What do we define gardens as? Genesis. We defined it as the beautiful woman, didn't we? The vineyard. So those who've lived their life in sensuality, those who've actually dedicated themselves to the exploration and the enjoyment of the physical form. I want to hear your voice. You direct me. You tell me what to do next. That's the life direction. This is my new path. This is my dove. This is what I've seen in her eyes. I want to take instruction from you now. So, the fact she replies makes good sense. So, she, he calls for instruction from elsewhere, and she gives the instruction. He solicits counsel from those who've dedicated their lives to sensuality, and she replies and says, well, then I know where we need to go. Come away with me. Come away from Jerusalem, my beloved. Come play like a stag or a young gazelle on the spice-laden mountain. So she leads him away to pleasures and leads him away, in fact, unwittingly, to his own destruction. And so there's the final scene, the final verse. Come, and interestingly, the Hebraists uh, have done another great job here. They say, we don't understand why but the word is flee. It's not come away, it's flee away. And then they, they understandably say, we have no idea what he's supposed to be fleeing from. Because the only thing we can think of is her, and he's not fleeing from her, he's going with her. Which is correct, he is going with her. What is he fleeing from? God. Yeah. Because the Hebraists, who aren't necessarily see a spiritual dimension, don't see any significance in the city of Jerusalem. It's just a place. But in the Bible, the city of Jerusalem isn't just a place. It's the metaphor and standing for the presence of God. That what is what she is calling him to flee away from. Sure. On your slide before where you said he was seeking a counsel from sensuality. Right. You know, in Isaiah, um, the description of, of God, which eventually applies to Jesus, is he is the wonderful counselor. And in Revelation, he, when he talks to, I believe it's Laodicea, he says, I counsel you. Jesus is, you know, talking to them. So he is right. completely going away from good counsel. That's right. That's, that's, that's a very good point. I like that uh, comparison. Norm, please. The passive for it talks about flee youthful lust passions. Yes. So there the idea of flee would go away with that. Just that's ironic. Exactly. That's the, the, the ironic counterpoint, isn't yes. it? Flee from God towards youthful passions. Yeah. The, that's as me means, uh, so shun youthful passions and aim at righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call upon the Lord from a pure heart. Means the whole thing there is to kind of that. To the counterpart of what we've Yeah, and this is the closing line. And this, this confuses so many experts that they all say this can't be the closing line. Because in, in terms of a love song, this is a terrible closing line. It doesn't leave, it seems to leave everything hanging. But from our perspective to understand the spiritual dimension, this makes perfect, if, if very sad, sense. But if the, if the webcam is pointed on Jerusalem at all times, it has to end here because this is the point where they depart Jerusalem. And she leads him by the hand, willingly off to go play on the mountains. And it's the last thing we see. Uh, and so we've seen already his dedication. I will go to the mountain of death. Uh, he, I will spend the night there, he says. I have gathered my death with my pleasure. Those three verses now all linked together in this closing line of her calling him away to play on the spice-laden mountains. And so I think ultimately, the bride lures the king away from Jerusalem. And so the Song of Songs, as a chapter in Solomon's life, 
I think ultimately ends in tragedy. That chapter, at least. Let's hope and pray for his sake it's not the last chapter, but that is how the song closes out. But I do suggest to you that Solomon's story is not finished. That, Solomon, that, that when God takes an interest in someone, uh, he's not finished, he's not going to allow it to end that way, even though that's where the song ends. So let's just spend a couple of minutes in Ecclesiastes. First of all, we notice it's kind of satisfactory it happened that way. Solomon was the son of David, and he was given the throne of Jerusalem, and he was given a promise that if he obeyed God's law, he could sit on that throne forever. And yet he failed. Why? Because ultimately he was a man of flesh. There will be a second son of David, and there will be a second throne of Jerusalem on which that second son will sit. And always where the natural comes first, here comes the Adam, son of David, so then comes the Christ-like son of David, who will sit on the throne of Jerusalem and live and succeed. So it makes sense. It's part of this natural theme we have in the scripture, that first there's always a natural attempt that's born out of the strength of man and always falls flat on its face. And then there is the spiritual gift of grace from God. And I'd like to note, uh, I think one of the reasons that we, end, or our community, and some Bible expositors get caught in trying to see the Song of Songs as positive, is because of the order of the books. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. I don't think it's a good idea to try and run a, a theme of, of exposition through the order of the books. But if you must, at least get the order of the books right. And this is the order of the books as according to you know, the Jewish scrolls. And the Song of Songs, it actually goes Psalms, Job, Proverbs, Ruth, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes. So Ecclesiastes, as one of the works of Solomon, actually comes after the Song of Songs, not before. So if you want to run a timeline thread, and I wouldn't do that myself anyway, at least let's get the books in the right order. And it's not the order in which we currently receive them in the Western printing. Just for interest's sake. The words of the teacher, or preacher, or the Hebrew word koelet, and, and it's worth knowing that word, because sometimes in a Bible it will actually be given as the name of the book, koelet, meaning uh, Ecclesiastes. Son of David, king in Jerusalem. And it's often disputed who wrote this book. Um, some debate the identity of the preacher, but I think we can be absolutely 100% sure it is Solomon. Why can we be 100% sure it's Solomon? There's a verse in Ecclesiastes that says so. The, the, the words of the Preacher. But there were many preachers, so it can't be that. Uh, uh, king of, of, uh, the king in Jerusalem? There were 20 of those. No. And they were all sons of David, in the sense that son means descendant. How do we know, therefore, that it was, some say it's Uzziah and other stuff. There is a verse Israel. I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I think it's verse 12. Yes. No other son of David ruled Israel from Jerusalem, it was the kingdom split up of Solomon. The other sons of David who ruled in Jerusalem only ruled over Judah. Not one of those could say, I was king over Israel and Jerusalem. But fine, no? yeah. So there it is. So we can be clear, it's Solomon. And you can tell this is a book written by an older man who has regrets. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless, is the first thing. And I suggest to you, that this is indeed Solomon returning many years later from the mountains of spices or the mountains of myrrh to which he was led. I think this is an older man crawling back and thinking, what have I been doing? And one of the giveaways, and I think we've mentioned this verse, I think Norm, you may have mentioned this verse uh, yesterday. Look, says the teacher, this is what I've discovered, adding one thing to another to discover the scheme of things. While I was still searching but not finding, I found one upright man among a thousand, but not one upright woman among them all. This is a verse that many of my female friends, <coughs> many of my sisters, find extremely offensive. And I can understand why. Because if this verse is written by anyone other than Solomon, it merely says your probability of righteousness is 0 .001, or 0 0.001 if you're male and 0 0.000 if you're female. That's a pretty misogynistic statement. Is this just misogyny? Is this just anti-female? Not if it's written by Solomon. Because he's not talking about a global census of all men and all women. He's talking about a specific one man, and he's talking about a specific thousand women. And he's not even criticizing the women, because why are those thousand women in his life in the first place? Because he chose them. He chose these thousand women, 
and that nearly killed him. So his actual comment is an indictment, not of them, but of himself. I was the most powerful man on earth. I could have chosen anyone as a bride. In fact, I chose a thousand brides, and I made 1,000 bad choices. So this is a man who has begun to realize the extent of his own foolishness, and there is nothing more beautiful at the beginnings of recovery than a man who knows what terrible mistakes he has made. So Solomon was specially blessed by God. Why was he specially blessed by God? What do I mean by that? As a promise. Yeah, because of that special blessing of wisdom that he, that he had, which Sherry noted was actually he asked only for wisdom over other people. That was an interesting insight. A number of people have enjoyed that time. He was specially blessed by God, but he squandered that blessing. Where have we heard that before? Well, not from our own lives. Prodigal son is a good example from Luke 15. Esau, that you, there's really no wrong answer here. But who particularly was given special powers by God? Samson. Threw it all away. Samson. And I think the reason we're going here is to start to ask the question, what's the big picture? What's this Song of Solomon for? And we can't answer that without the consideration of Samson. And so the fact that I've entitled these talks Solomon and Delilah, for surely Delilah was not actually her name, I've no idea what it was, I merely, I merely mean that in type. Solomon too met his Delilah, which caused his downfall. And the fact that uh, the, the, the bride in the Song of Songs isn't really to blame, I see also as parallel that I don't particularly see Delilah as a scheming, conniving, deliberately wicked uh, contributor to uh, Samson's downfall. For what it's worth, know this, there is biblical evidence, biblical evidence that she was assassinated. Okay, so. If you don't know, that's, which is a new take, perhaps, on the Sunday school story we talk. Have a look in your Bibles and see if you can find where it is. Meanwhile, Samson, he was given a special blessing, a special blessing of physical power. I'm not saying he was physically any larger than a regular man, but clearly he had more power. He grew, the Lord blessed him, the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. God gave Samson unique physical strength. And we know the stories of striking down a thousand Philistines, a thousand Interesting, isn't it? Just a little, little echo memory. A thousand Philistines with the jawbone and ass. But the giant threw it all away. He fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And yet God redeemed the fallen giant. The Philistine, the Philistine sees Samson and gouged out his eyes. And this is a beautiful verse in its own right. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. It wasn't anything Samson did. You, we don't make our own hair grow. It's something that God had done for him. You got yourself in such a mess it all got cut off, didn't it, Samson? I helped it grow back again, says God. It's just a wonderful way of how redemption from the Father works. And we don't even need to change the, uh, <coughs> change the schemes to see exactly the same picture in Solomon. Solomon was the intellectual giant, where Samson was the physical giant. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. And God gave Solomon unique intellectual strength. And Solomon threw it all away. I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. And yet, God redeemed the fallen giant. Moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge as he had done once long ago, at the very beginning of his reign. I think there's a hint here, we can't prove it, but a hint of recovery of that fallen giant. Here's a lovely detail I'd like to share with you, and it hasn't been in previous iterations of this presentation. Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother. Remember the story? He falls in love with a Philistine woman, a foolish boy, and his parents are extremely grieved. So when he goes down to see her, he actually takes his parents with him, perhaps they insisted on coming along, I don't know. I hadn't noticed that before. As they approached Timna, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward him. That's not a complete quote. That's not a blanked out part of it. As they approached what? You ever notice? It's very interesting. It's such a meaningless detail, so it seems you wouldn't notice it. <laughs> very good, Jen. As they approached the vineyards of Timna, 
the lion, which you may never have noticed, sprang out of the vineyard. That's interesting. A, because it's weird, lions don't hang around in vineyards. They don't go into cultivated areas where there's just vegetation to eat. So what's that saying? How would we translate that using the symbols that we have? What was the, what was the vineyard representing? The fertile, beautiful woman. And what is a lion? The lion sprang out of the woman. What's that saying for Samson? It's saying this is where your danger lies. This danger will spring out at you from the fertile woman. And, and so I think that's the detail that's given to us. Because who cares that the lion gets? What difference would it make if the lion sprang down from the rocks, where it much more likely would have been? No, this is a spiritual book, the Bible, and it's teaching us these deep things. The lion came out of the vineyard. The danger for Samson came from these fertile woman, women to whom he was so susceptible. Do you also notice the other mistake in the verse? I say mistake advisedly. Someone might look at that and say, poor grandma. It is poor grandma. Look at that. How can that be right? As they approached the vineyards, the lion came towards him. Excuse me, there's three people together. That's the wrong person. Or is it? Or is God actually telling us something? What's he telling us? That danger was, it was directed at him. Yeah. His parents didn't have this problem. This danger, this lion came only for him. The lion that springs out of the vineyard is only your problem, Samson. Your parents are not susceptible to this nonsense. And so I think that's, you know, careful reading of our scriptures just reveals these wonderful jewels and gems that may have previously uh, gone unnoticed. So all I'm saying is this helps us understand the purpose of the Song of Solomon, the big picture. God creates a supreme physical being, either supreme in physical strength or supreme in intellectual strength. He creates a giant, if you will. I use the word as a metaphor. But in both cases, the sexual distractions precipitated the collapse of the giant. Why was it invariably sexual distractions that uh, precipitated their collapse? I can't be sure. But the thing is, if you are a physical giant, if you have supreme physical properties or supreme intellectual properties, you actually, in the natural world, avail yourself of many mating opportunities. Right? This is a very sort of base comment and a basic comment, but that's the point. You actually become attractive to more potential mates. So you have the opportunity to indulge yourself more than, more than otherwise. Sherry. Sure. When it describes the three sins, it says the lust of the eyes first. So maybe that's why. It's a powerful one, for sure. It's, it's worth mentioning just three sins. It's a very fair point. And finally, God finds redemption for the fallen giant. For this reason, knowing the, uh, the end result of Samson's life, I speculate with some strength and some support that Solomon too, God found his redemption. And that uh, teaches, this is one of the reasons the Song of Solomon exists, because it underlines this big point uh, that runs throughout Scripture. Neither physical nor intellectual supremacy will bring you salvation. Samson does not lead you into the kingdom of God. Solomon does not lead you into the kingdom of God. If it's all about our biceps or our brains, these would be our Messiah. Right? But Samson didn't work out to be the Messiah. Solomon didn't work out to be the Messiah. This is the big picture lesson, and you don't have that big picture full, filled in until you've got this contributed. Jeremy? I wanted to ask this question for a while, but now that you have this slide up, I think it's uh, extra pertinent. Okay. Um, like, why is Song of Songs unique in its style of giving the message? It's very graphic, right? I mean, I think it's kind of unique in the Bible, in the way that it goes about teaching this message, right? You could just look to the other <coughs> column here and ask, why doesn't the story of Samson follow uh, a similar trend in describing uh, the woman and the man and their relationship? Okay. Um, I, I think it needs to be included somewhere, so the fact it's included on either side works for me. In a way, the story of Samson does. You know, the story of Samson says, did you know a lion sprang out of the vineyard? That is the same kind of very, very oblique, very graphical, very poetical language. But because we've decided to read that as prose, we don't take note of it in that way. On the other hand, you can also read the song in a very literal manner. I think it can be read 
very, you know, very graphically in that literal manner. So is the Song of Songs that unique? It's a song. Jesus also told parables. Someone mentioned the prodigal son. The prodigal son never even lived. Jesus sang a song about a prodigal son, if you will. So I'm not too sure of the idea of a parabolic teaching isn't that unique. Matthew 13 says, Jesus says, I'm not going to teach except by means of pictures and parables. So I'm, I don't see it as that unique. It is very graphic. It is quite lurid in many people's uh, eyes. But I don't see it as too different from the rest of Scripture in its style. That might be my lack. I'm not an expert of literary analysis, to say that right now. But, but uh, that, that's, that's all the answer I have, is that we do see aspects of this language in these passages, and we do see aspects of this teaching style in the words of Jesus in the New Testament. Is that fair, as at least? Um, I mean, I think you have to agree it contains more sexuality. Oh, I see. You, 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 you. Okay. Solomon um, was a romantist in the sense, if he had a thousand wives, then obviously he had that romantic side to him. So I right. see it sort of as a it's poetry right. love triangle, Romeo Juliet type. You know, thing versus Samson was more, you know, rough and gruff and right. maybe not quite as sensitive as Solomon was. It's kind of like in the Gospels, you know, they're okay. written from the viewpoint of the tax collector or the, right. you know, the different sort of, you can see different writings that come from different mindsets. True. No, I think I, I, I agree with that. I, I mean, take your point. In terms of being sexually explicit, the Song of Songs does uh, focus on that, but it certainly shows up in many other parts of the Bible. And if you wrote the Bible out in its entirety, it would be sexually explicit and graphic in, in a great many different places. But I, you know, I think also it's true that God speaks in many voices because different people have many types of ears. And those who are not drawn by the events of the Chronicles can appreciate the Psalms and the Song of Songs. I don't think the Song of Songs is any more poetic than some of the Psalms. It's not any more sexually explicit than some of the actions in Judges chapter 19, for example. So it does combine those two, but there are different styles combined in different places. The Bible speaks in many voices because it's talking to many people who hear in different ways. I don't think this, I mean, the book of Job, when I spent a lot of time in that, for a while appeared to be the most unique book of the Bible and everything else kind of grayed out. And now I look at the Song of Songs, I can see a similar thing as you are seeing. I think when you really focus on one book, you see its unique elements, and you see those unique parts of the book come to the fore. So in a way, each of the books is unique. I don't find this one as standing out bizarrely. I mean, look at Revelation, my goodness. Is there anything more bizarre and unique in terms of the use of symbol? And yet you can say, well, Revelation might, might use more symbol than any other book. There's a heck of a lot of symbol in sexual form in the Song of Songs. In the Song of Songs, the book of sexual symbols, but it's no more sexual than the events of, say, Judges 19. And Judges 19 is sexual and violent, but it's no more violent than the events of, I think there is an interconnectivity in Scripture, even in style. That's, that's my testimony. I can't make that proof. But I, I thank you for your, for your question, certainly. And I, and I would say, you know, it is, again, it fits together here. It, it makes this picture complete. This is the part we needed to, this is the part we needed to know to see that these two stories are the same. The story of that physical supremacy does not interestingly differ from the story of intellectual supremacy. And in fact, Jeremiah had said, let me paraphrase, let not Solomon boast of being Solomon, or Samson boast of being Samson. These are not our messiahs. And I think part of the reason that we uh, we're taught this is because we haven't fully learned it. We haven't fully learned it. We still rely on our biceps to some extent, and we still rely on our brains, and we still believe that somehow, if we learn enough, study enough, we can somehow qualify for the kingdom of God as if Solomon was the one leading us there. So if the physical giant is no good and the intellectual giant is no good, then clearly what screams aloud is either we're lost or we need another giant. And this is where God introduced his own son. This is why it draws our thoughts to bread and wine, hopefully appropriately, because it introduces the need for the fact that we've seen what fails us. Now we need to see what can succeed. Not of ourselves, since we're not naturally spiritual beings. We're naturally beings that look for supremacy in the physical and supremacy in the intellectual. To some extent, this giant has passed. 
The days when if you were physically bigger and stronger, you naturally became the leader are somewhat uh, past. You see that much more in a thousand years ago than you see it today. But you still see the idea that men who are taller are looked up to, sometimes more than just physically. You know, the directors of a, of a company will be on the top floor of their building. There's still that response in our psyche that says, if it's physically above, it's better. And I think that the god that we, or the giant that we wrongly follow these days, is certainly the giant of the intellect. I get a lot more respect because I have a PhD in physics than ever I get for being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're turning to a society which ever more will begin to mock me for being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ while still praising me as long as I present myself as a doctor of physics. Mm -hmm. We are falling into the intellectual God. Therefore, the Song of Solomon particularly says, well, here it is. If you want intellectual, intellectual supremacy to lead you to the kingdom of God, Solomon is our Messiah. Let's read about it and see what happens. That doesn't work. Nikki, let's see your hands. Well, I was thinking as you were speaking about this that the Old Testament um, was very crucial to Jesus. He learned so many lessons from the Old Testament. Right. And so here uh -huh. you could see in reading these stories the physical and the intellectual that led to death and that he had to be so spiritual to bring life not only for himself but for all of us. So I think he appreciated those stories, and it must have made him stronger in, in mind and responding to God. He was that the perfect man. Right. Where these looked perfect, but they weren't. That's right. And I think we see that very clearly in the temptation in the wilderness. Uh, and as a younger man, it would baffle me as to why Jesus' responses in the temptations of the wilderness were so, quotes, lame, as I used to see them. You know, he, we knew he was part of the Pharisees. And when the Pharisees set an intellectual trap, should we pay taxes to Caesar or no, he came back with an even cleverer answer. Rather to Caesar, that which is Caesar's, and to God, that which is God's. But when it came to the temptation in the wilderness, whoever that was, and I would claim it was Jesus' own mind, he, couldn't, he didn't try to be clever. It was like, no, the word of God wins, nothing else will happen. No, the word of God wins, nothing else will happen. He became a simple, humble man in order to overcome that final temptation, physical, physically and intellectually, we never could. So Solomon rediscovers the right path. I don't know what happens to the picture on that page, never mind. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And what is nice to note in the Hebrew, of course, that duty is implied. So it may mean the whole duty of man, or it may actually mean fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole man. Or rather, this is how man becomes whole. As long as he focuses here, he'll ignore this. As long as he focuses here, he'll ignore this. But if he focuses on Christ, it's not as if we don't have any physical or intellectual prowess and we can use them in God's service. But this is how we become the whole man. Fear God and keep his commandments. And in this way, we become the whole man. So those are the thoughts that I would share with you that we follow the spiritual giant and we turn to him now in bread and wine, our celebration thereof. And I think that even though the Song of Songs clearly ends in tragedy, that chapter of his life ends in tragedy, I think Solomon ends himself in Christ's victory as we all have the ability to do. Thank you very much for your attention.